very excited for our new episode of the Diva Chat. But as you can see, I don't have a diva here. Well, not in the strictest sense. Right. So we are changing to the title today to be Devo Chat. And I'm thrilled that I have William Berger here, the author of several books on opera, including Wagner Without Fear, Verdi with a Vengeance, Puccini Without Excuses, and I understand he's writing Massenet Without Money. So... <laughs> so that's a good one. Um, he's written on a variety of subjects, including architecture, religion, Hispanic issues, and cultural identity and sports. Besides being a big opera fanatic, he's also a dichotomy because he's into heavy metal. And we're going to talk about all that, too. So, Will, welcome. That's I'm so dichotomy. honored you're here. Thank you. We'll talk about why that isn't a dichotomy. Yes, why okay. it isn't a dichotomy. Well, right. I have a good story about that, too, so we'll talk okay, about that. Put that on hold. Put it yes. Um, so tell us about you and where you're from and um, how you made it here. I am uh, I was, I'm from Los Angeles, uh, born in 1961, which at that time and in those days was not considered a hotbed of cultural activity. Although that's a little unfair too, because there was a lot of uh, music and many, many people were there, especially uh, after, during and after World War II, um, had come as sort of to get away from all that. Uh, so there really was a lot, but yes, I'm from Los Angeles and I am uh, from a mixed background family, which I, turned out to be part of my story in terms of the arts and all that. My father was Jewish and I, he died when I was fairly young, 11. And um, I don't know a lot about his family that that was their experience was sort of to stay under the radar as uh, refugees from for generations. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to uncover some of that now. And my mother's family, but she was Mexican and Italian. You knew my mother. Yes, I knew I your mother you very well. Yeah, she's very much a character type, you know, uh, from New York, but uh, was in LA at the time of uh, Italian and Mexican parents, but we were very Mexican American identified. We spoke Spanish. Um, that was how we ate and this sort of thing. I had other Italian American family here in New York. And there was a lot going on with languages and um, things like that. There was uh, a lot of music. And one thing we had, uh, my mother was an opera fan. We had the Met Saturday matinee, which was Saturday morning in LA. Yeah. Podcasts from as far back as I can remember. And that was, you know, that was no noise during that time. You know, that was... Uh, and, but also just in the family, there was a rule, speaking of different tastes in music, that uh, if it was for music, no questions asked. And that was on both sides of the family. My father's stepbrother, who was involved in classical music, um, also, if you wanted a ticket, <coughs> excuse me, for a live event, uh, just ask. And we didn't always have money, but we'd worry about that later. Right. My mother was very clear that, um, you know, you're, it's a moment in time that won't repeat. Right, exactly. So, um, and then once a week, we would go up to Tower Records on Sunset Boulevard, and uh, you could have one of anything. No questions asked. Uh, so... That, that was how, that was the role of music. It was not a traditional role, but uh, it was there. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so then I ended up, well, a lot of places in between uh, there and here, and then ended up in New York permanently. We were here a lot to visit. 
uh, family and so forth. Um, ended up living here in 1984 and uh, I've been here ever since and have been at the Met since 2006, but a lot, a lot of- Yeah, a lot of twisting and turning. Yeah, I did not have the, uh, you know, the, the clear trajectory of, all right, so you're gonna grow up and uh, this is what you're gonna do to have a career in music right. at all. Right. So. It's funny um, because you, in, in, in the introductions to your books, talk about a little bit about San Francisco Opera. Yeah. Yeah. And that is one of the few opera companies in the United States. You know, when, when I was growing up, and you and I are pretty much of the same ilk right, there, right. Um, there was the Met, which I, I grew up in New York, so I was lucky I had the Met, right. you know. It was right. the Met, there was the Chicago, yes. and then there was San Francisco. Correct. That was it. Basically. That yeah. was it. Later on, you had um, Houston, Dallas, Santa Fe, and sure. the new, well, of course, the New York City Opera, and sure. then the New York City Opera was out in L.A. LA. That's what we got. That was yeah. the first several. Yeah, like, Dorothy Chandler, like, I think Dorothy it was. Chandler Pavilion, right. Right. Um, and uh, San Francisco Opera, uh, also, I mean, San Francisco and L.A. are very different and very distant from each other in many ways, but we managed to get there quite a bit, and then I went to... Um, school in Santa Cruz, UC Santa Cruz. I'm very vain about that. I'm a banana <laughs> slug. And uh, that, that's our team mascot. And um, worked at San Francisco Opera on and off during that time in the early 80s. And, but also visited before then and attended performances before and after. And yes, San Francisco Opera, it's interesting. It, it was not only known internationally as it still is, but it had a specific kind of profile, which was, uh, it was known as the company that found the emerging great singers. Uh, yes. You know, that would sometimes people often, and really to this day, would make their debuts there before they got onto the track of the, the monstrous machinery that is the Metropolitan Opera. So, um, it had this reputation from the days of Pietro Mascagni and Luigi uh, um, and Luisa Tetrazzini yeah. you know, before the earthquake and all this of being a sort of outpost of civilization in general, um, as Addison DeWitt makes uh, reference to in All About Eve, but also specifically opera. And um, and that was very much in the air when you were working at San Francisco Opera. Uh, I was there in the 80s. It's still there to a certain extent. Um, this idea of there, there is a, a tradition that is somewhat mythological, not meaning false, but meaning it's an old story that's been told a lot uh, about what the San Francisco Opera is and has been and is. And so I, I thought that was really interesting. So you kind of um, piggybacked, I would say, on two different eras at San Francisco, Kurt yeah. Herbert Adler and uh, Terry McEwen. Yes. Uh, yes. And um, that was interesting because I was at the very end of the Adler administration. I met him, talked to him uh, more than once. And it was, it was funny because he had a reputation of being very difficult with people who are in say upper management or mm -hmm. people. but then for people like me I was basically a gopher uh very entry level just do whatever needed to be done and he was sort of good in a mentoring way with, well that's nice yeah I mean in in the sense of like he liked to talk to people like so what are you up to who are you why are you here and all that and I, that was that was great. Uh, then Terry McEwen came, um, and I, I had a lot of interaction with his office, not so much with him directly, but interesting was uh, Sarah Billingshurst. Yeah, and then she came to the Met. Yeah, yeah, and um, that was very educational. And uh, but yes, there were definitely 
there were people who were more invested in the memories of 20 years before, 30 years before, and more. And there were people who were more invested in, well, what are we going to do about it now? Now. And as, as always. So if you had to pick one performance, because you know, we have, we we're very lucky. I mean, we've worked with Luana Duvall, you know, and she, of course, is from California, North, Northern California. Yes. And she started at San Francisco yes. Opera. And of course, Tashina Vaughn, who has been at San Francisco. Um, and now one of our winners of our competition last year, the dramatic voice, Andres Cascante, is going to the Merrill program. Yes, I know. Andres yeah. Cascante, who is a fellow metalhead, by the yeah. way. Yeah, I, I found that out. Yes. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, it's certainly a great company. But I want to know from you, if you had to pick one night that stood out in San Francisco, what it would be for you? What is okay, that memory? Hold on a sec. Let me oh, boy, look at that. Uh, the, quite a few. Quite a few. Yeah. But um, interestingly, among uh, the memorable, for many reasons, uh, nights we, was um, the somewhat legendary opening night Otello. With Placido Domingo. And here is a ticket. Oh my God. Uh, on That's my, the uh, one where you had to wait six hours for him to show up. Yes, uh, <laughs> on, on a plane that was sent by Gordon Getty. And yeah. uh, it was very exciting. It ended, it ended with a great breakfast party uh, at a, a, a popular brunchy spot the next morning. And, and then I went to work and what people don't remember as much is that then that night, it was the second night of the season, and that night was um, Katya Kabanova. Oh my God. And we were getting a, quite a bit of, um, a, again, in that way that singers were introduced, so was a lot of repertory in that time. Yeah. The Met did not have an adventurous repertory right. in the right, same they way didn't. it does now. And um, so Janacek was basically introduced to this country the San Francisco Opera and Sir Charles McCarris was right, conducting. Yeah. We had Anya Sulia right. uh, singing in roles there. And um, who else? Elizabeth Soderstrom. Soderstrom. And a lot of people. Uh, and Benachkova, too. Gabriela Benachkova, yes. I don't remember who the cast was that night because there was also Yenifa right before that. It was all, or maybe it was Yenifa because, oh my God, I'm getting of that age, right? But anyway, there are archives at the Met. You asked about brain fog. That's it. Yes, there are <laughs> there are archives at the Met and San Francisco Opera, and it's fun actually because sometimes people from that era and I, you know, we start arguing the way old people do at the Met. Are you kidding? That wasn't so and so. That was such and such. Yeah, and yeah. Now you can go there and say, "All right, everybody, be quiet. Let's find out." So uh, that all comes together. I also. You asked for one, of course, you're not going to get one. Yeah, of course. Um, but real quickly, we did, we had some, besides emerging singers, we also had some great singers from the previous uh, very wonderful uh, generation of, of singers also still singing there. We had a, a Norma with Sutherland and Horn that was uh, memorable and um, also a uh, Die Frau in a Schatten with uh, Birgit Nilsson and, you know, all, all this. So uh, there was a lot of that on the one hand, and then uh, newer and, and somewhat uh, adventurous things on the other. Yeah, it's true. Well, you know, we okay, were very lucky. Here's one more I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, because this is a little more unusual. Uh, La Gioconda, which we just don't get to see as much. Pavarotti and Scotto? No, it was not that one. That was that was uh, 1979, and this right. was 82 or 83, 83, and it was Caballé, Montserrat Caballé. Oh my and, God! Um, Franco Bonisoli, Maria Manuela. Uh, I believe it was was Mignon Dunn in that. I believe she was as La Checa. Uh, I'm not sure, but it was terrific. And one thing I remember. Uh, here was another thing that was fun about San Francisco Opera. It was, it had the reputation of being a place singers, international singers 
wanted to go yes. at that time because there was a great, I, I don't even know what the word would be, but Gemütlichkeit, like there was this great feeling, people would make a fuss over them and it was, it was kind of a coming home thing. So for example, when Katia Ricciarelli came to sing uh, La Traviata, she had uh, bottles of mum champagne, very good champagne, sent around to every department in the opera and then also served on stage during the uh, party scene. Nice. And when, when Montserrat Caballé came to do La Gioconda, she had a, a local, very, very highly regarded uh, bakery deliver in a truck, in a van, boxes of pastries to the entire company, every department as her like present. And stuff like that was quite typical. And it had that feeling. That, that was well, it, it made you, it, you know, they felt home and they made you feel like a family. Yeah, and that is so. what's it, so it nice. Back and forth. Um, and I, I don't, I, you know, I, that sort of thing seems to not be possible today for a lot of reasons, you know, right. not because right. civilization has fallen or anything, but uh, in, in that way. Right. And, um, so those are some nice memories I have. That's great. Um, I had the great pleasure, I think you know that, of meeting Terry McEwen and, and uh, I was on the opera quiz with him. And he was, he was very nice to me. He was very, at the beginning, he was very aloof. Uh -huh. Because here I was, you know, a 20 year old kid. Uh -huh. And he's like, you know, who the hell are you? Right. But after it was over, he came over and he was very, very nice and very complimentary. And I was like, okay, that, you know, that's nice. I, to be, to be very honest with you, I was more interested in talking to Boris Goldovsky and Alberto Maziello, but he was still very, very nice. But um, yeah, um, and it couldn't be easy to run that company. So that's- It's not easy to run any company. Any company, uh, no. Workshop level to the Metropolitan. No, it's not, believe me. I have, People I have the- would really be surprised. I have the grace to prove it. Any idea, right. If they had any idea of the issues at stake that you never hear about, the things right. that have to be considered when you say things like, oh, why can't they do this opera with that cast? And it's like, you know, it's, it's really, a, a, it's kind of a, you know, the game whack-a-mole. At, at yeah, it's very true. There's a lot of whack-a-mole. Right. So uh, the one thing, uh, and then we'll move on from San Francisco, but the one yeah. thing that we had here, um, at least, was for many years, I forget, um, for us it was QXR, but they broadcast the San Francisco Opera opening nights. I didn't know that. Yeah, and I've got a lot of them. And um, it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful to hear you know, what, what another company does. And, you know, they also did the same thing with the uh, Chicago Lyric. They used to do the Chicago Lyric. Wow. In those days, when the Met ended, and they, the Met ended with Texaco around April, the middle of April or so, then they would do the Chicago Lyric. Oh, in I do June. remember that. I do remember that. Yeah, no. but there was, there was a time when um, they had the San Francisco uh, opera and it was wonderful and I remember listening to that Otello with it was a, it was a wonderful performance on right. everything Margaret yeah. Price and Silvana Caroli and yeah it was crazy uh, one other thing while well, speaking about you know history that is unknown and I'm not even sure a lot of people know about this at the San Francisco Opera now but there was a librarian there back in the day I don't remember his whole name Robin was his first name. And he said, it was not every performance, but pretty much almost every performance and one of every uh, run of operas since at least the 40s, maybe before, had a primitive, but a, a super eight or whatever the equivalent was, film of it. Really? It was completely just for for whatever purposes. And there were things that in a strange archive that were completely unknown and unexploited in the right way. You know what I mean? And for example, and one of the things I used to do when I had time was 
run over to this office and say, what can we look at? And things like um, Giulietta Simeonato's American debut in on a relatively blank stage in Il Trovatore. Wow. And things like that. And it just amazing historical things. So I hope uh, some of that can be found, restored, made. And again, the expenses and legal difficulties and challenges of doing that are much greater than you would think. But there is that, and that was a neat thing. So Wow, that is a neat thing. Yeah. So now you're at the Met, and yeah. you, you came in at a time when it was really in transition. Yeah. The transition of the whole idea of broadcast I mean, what was changing. So how much input did you have when you had to really go into a new format? I mean, you know, you, you started with four nights a week and then I guess you realized that that was a little, that was somewhat a lot and now you've moved back. But I think financially, maybe that's another reason. I don't, I don't know, well, but hard. we loved it. We loved four nights a week. Yeah, I'm fine on it. I'd be happy with four nights a week again, but also, it, part of it was financial, part of it was it was found to be not entirely necessary, like um, less than, if you had, I mean, I had three performances of everything in the course of the season would be ideal to hit up. Right, and, right. And that, that's fine. That gives the listener a selection to choose from time-wise and so forth, and also as much as you need to hear, you know, with different casts or whatever or somebody has an off night or whatever. Um, but okay, yes, well, what happened was, and this is interesting, we did not know what would happen and we did not know what to prepare for. Uh, the contract for, okay, Peter Gelb was coming in 2006, mm -hmm. opening night, starting right. with a new production, Madame, Madame Butterfly, mm -hmm. um, and I was brought here with Margaret Chuntway. Uh, she had started before uh, on the Saturday broadcast. Right. She took over for Peter, uh, Peter, Peter Allen. Allen. Yeah. And, but she was still, we were both working at WNYC, which was and is the public radio station here in New York. And uh, she was evening music. I was overnight music. I was the crazy guy that everybody assumed was stoned. I wasn't, but everybody assumed was. <laughs> who could play very weird things if I wanted, and would sometimes, not as much as you would think, but at four in the morning, and I, I was the darling of the, all the taxi drivers. Mm -hmm. um, so there was that. And four hours uh, couldn't sleep. We came, right, we came here, um, the, uh, and Elena Park, who was the station manager or program manager, I forget the exact title, from WNYC. And I was brought on under no title or whatever, just, all right, we'll be doing something here, we'll figure it out, but we don't know what we're doing yet. So scripts for radio and this sort of thing, fine. The way I remember it, this may not be exactly true date-wise, but of course the Med always opens on a Monday night. Right. As I remember it, the contract with Sirius XM was signed the Friday before. Oh my God. Yes. Uh, and so that may be one or two days off, but that was basically the idea. And so it was a matter of, okay, we have this opportunity, make it work. And I wasn't on air at the time. It was Margaret Juntway was going to do all of those alone. And she said, absolutely not. I need to have him in the booth, at least. Like, you know, that radio thing where people may not know, but sometimes there's somebody sitting in the booth. I believe, I believe Peter Allen's wife would do this. Yeah, um, I like think so. Like writing notes and say like, go to this or read this and all right. that. And uh, we did that for a couple of nights. And then she said, you need to be a Margaret Jumway said, we need to have him on air. I said, why, you know, but like as sort of almost, we didn't know what there would be like commentator didn't exist. 
at the time. So it would be like, uh, if you remember on Frasier, you had Roz who was the producer, but she would pipe in and kind of stir right. it. Um, so maybe like that. Because I was, we had at the time, the radio booth was the same one on the Grand Tier, which had been constructed for Milton Cross for one person. And I was literally sitting on the floor. It was the only place handing notes. I've been notes. in that booth, I know. Right. For, yeah. about, for, for about three broadcasts. And then uh, we said no. And um, we had a studio built on the sixth floor of the Met right. with closed circuit and um, quickly moved up there for a lot of reasons. Uh, and uh, I started doing on-air commentary. But that was all within the first month. And we had um, uh, this immediate barrage of things like it was uh, the new Madama Butterfly. Um, Idomeneo, I remember, was in there. La Gioconda, mm -hmm. uh, which Margaret had never had an opportunity to see on stage before, you know, because it hadn't been done in her time in New York here, um, and so on and so forth, all of that. So that's how this format came about. And um, so I was really right. And she had worked with Iris Sip at W. Oh, is that how that came about? Yeah. I was wondering. She had worked with Iris Sip and um, thought that he would be good for the Saturdays, which is a very different, yeah, uh, a different now, animal. Different thing. Yeah. yeah. So, and I was all in favor of that because I've been a fan of Iris Sip for ages. And I do um, production on the Saturday matinee broadcast. So I'm busy enough. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, so that sort of thing, but it was very much the um, Met broadcast, the um, weeknight broadcasts, uh, which are also live streamed once a week on our website. Yep. So you don't always need Sirius XM for all that, but Sirius XM is great too, because you get the archival and so on and so forth. That was another thing that was um, completely new. We had this, we had our archive of performances not complete, going back to the first one in 1931, but almost. Right. And complete after a certain point, complete after 1940, I believe. Um, and there was this whole archive and we had to come up with, well, what do we do with it? So we got that back into production. In other words, had to clean up the, some of these, some of them were irretrievable, but some right. of them were, uh, nitrite tapes that had corrupted, some were not, some were salvageable. So we've got a whole crew, we had a whole crew, we still do to a certain extent, but much less. All right, here's our archive, do something great with it. Let's get it out there and get people hearing it. And we've you got, got the Met on, well, serious. And now you have the Met on demand, which is well, wonderful too. Thing, right, right. Yeah, and, but all of that was, was the same. And all everything there needed scripts and everything needed a, a wraparound and everything needed, here was a performance in 1945 of Mignon, and here's what Mignon is, and here's what that here's why people like that, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So that that was neat. Well, it's so funny, you know, you brought up scripts. I, I was yeah. that was one of the things I wanted to talk about. You know, early on back in the 60s or when I started listening in the 60s, when they would have their um, talk with artists, yeah. usually in the first intermission, opera news on the air. Or, sure, sure, sure. And you'd have it uh, with Francis Robinson or somebody on that order. And they would say, oh, yes, we're going to have a talk now with Maria Collis. Thank you, Madam Collis. And they say, well, thank you so much, Mr. Robinson. I am so happy to be it here. And, it was and very, and it sounded very scripted. Now, I know that you write the scripts, but in, in every which way, it does not sound scripted, and that makes the listener much more at ease. It's interesting. Um, I'm I'm not scripted. I write the serious scripts, and for me, I don't write the script. Yeah, funny. I, I can't suppose, imagine why. Uh, well, I'm supposed to not be scripted because one right. of the things on serious, uh, as opposed to Saturday matinee, is that um, they don't go by our we. The conductor and the stage and the radio don't go by the same time. Right. Because <laughs> I can't hold them back. Right. 
except on Saturdays where it does, they're okay being timed for a lot of reasons they have a Saturday night performance and a lot else. But uh, so what I have to do, and this is kind of a fun little um, thing that I do that people may not know about, but I basically talk until there's a 10 second cue for the conductor. And, and so you can hear them calling the conductor on stage, but of course no, we don't I, hear no, that. No, I hear a separate, a separate cue that he, the, the conductor always got a 10, like, uh, okay, you can go anytime after 10 seconds. Okay. And they, they, it was, it still is with the light, but now I get a sound cue also with the light that goes off and then they play with their whatever baton and off they go. So what I have to do is talk until I have to shut up. Right. They don't wait for me. And that, that is, that's an art form of itself. Let me tell you. <laughs> and then, and it was one we had to work out because it had never been done before. So things like, you know, Margaret Chunkwaite and Mary Jo Heath, who was uh, our host after right. Margaret Chunkwaite up until last season. Uh, well, right. last season was weird, but yes. Um, right. So, you know, how, why they couldn't ask a question like, so Will, what do you think Wagner was up to when he wrote The Ring? And then I get 10 seconds. And as you know, I'd have to say, um, well, right. I'm looking forward to talking about that next intermission or something. Right. You know, uh, and then sometimes, so I, I talk those parts, I talk in 10 second intervals. In other words, with ideas that I'm not going to tell you something about this. And it was like this. And what's interesting about that is a bunch of stuff. Right. Including this and that. And the other. So I have to be able to drop out at any point with somebody, you know, incidentally yelling in my ear. Um, and so that's something interesting that I do. Now, the reason Ira doesn't do it quite that way, and the reason why Ira as a stage performer is so good at not sounding as scripted as they did in the 40s, it, well, he's a stage performer, but um, we also have that's a different broadcast network that includes the European Broadcast Union, right, right. ABC and all that. And they're following live cues too with things like, with even things like two second breaths. For example, they cannot broadcast something that will have an American phone number in it. Well, there are times so when there are I'm... things that when, when if Ira is, is saying something, and that's just one example, there are many things, but then there has to be a two second breathe cue that BBC and someone else, maybe in Argentina, will drop out of. And then he'll say, which visit our website at whatever or something. And then they all come back in. Right. right. And they talk, and all of this is stuff that you wouldn't know about that's really interesting. So, but, but the other thing that you bring up that's really interesting is um, what the public can, what the radio public processes and how, and what that right. was in 1945 is very different. You listen to it in a different way. That's right. Sitting in the living room, maybe, you know, maybe doing your knitting or a jigsaw puzzle or something, listening to the radio one way and, uh, maybe not in your car as you might be now or something else. So for one, since radio was newer, the idea of, uh, you know, a great star speaking on obvious, off of an obvious script was not as off-putting as it is now. Right, exactly, exactly. No, you're trying and to a lot of things like that. And that also becomes an issue with, you know, sometimes people write me and say, well, I grew up with Boris Goldovsky and Opera News on the Air. Why don't you do something like that? And it's like, well, I, I did too, and I loved it. And I'll tell you why I don't do that now. And it's, it's these sorts of considerations and where you, and also where you get information and how. Right. It's different. We're, it's we're, different. we're in a and computer it's age. Not, it's, not, it's not all about, you know, well, people are dumbed down and they have no attention spans. And no, there are a lot of other considerations too that, that you would find very interesting. Real quickly, 
um, Opera News on the Air, which started, I think, in 1947. I have a collection of ones that I read. Yeah. Um, and uh, one, okay, so Opera News on the Air, and I, I did some research on this, was Opera News at the time had a circulation, the magazine, a circulation of about 3,000. Right. Uh, which was virtually all in New York City. Right, I, and I would imagine, sure. So that um, when Boris Goldovsky was literally giving people the news that they wouldn't get any other way. Exactly. And not only that, okay, so then they, they made a concerted effort not only to spread it out into the country, but also in libraries and universities. And now that's where a lot of it is. So you can get your opera news, but also think about what that implies beyond that, like commentary. When Boris Goldovsky was speaking about Wagner, um, there was in English basically one text of Ernest Newman from the Times of London, Wagner Knights, uh, that, was, that changed yeah. names, but it's still an essential text. Right. Okay, that was 1947. Um, as the Library of Congress lists more books under the name of Richard Wagner now than any other name in the world. That's except right. Jesus Christ. That's right. Exactly. And that is a fact. So, That's right. so there's tons of commentary there, some of which, a great, <laughs> too much of which perhaps, written by me myself. Um, so I'm here to tell you there's a ton of stuff out there that you don't need the guy at the Met telling you. Now, this is what Siegfried is in the same way you needed it in 1947 because you didn't have access to other information then that you do now and better. That's very true. Other. That's very true because I remember my first ring um, was the very last year of the um, Von Karyon ring. Oh. So it was like 73, uh, 74, 74. Sure, yeah. It was Nielsen's last ring cycle. And I got to meet her. I got to meet her after that. It was really? just, oh yeah, she was in the dressing room. Oh my god, I'll never forget it. She was in this very tight leopard dress with really? this black wig on, and I'll never forget it. And she was drinking Rhine Gold, a small little bottle of Rhine Gold, and eating herring, herring beer, chick beer, and herring out of a can. They and say I, that's you know, in your throat, herring. Lenny. You know, and. And Frances Robinson took me back, and I got to meet her. And that, I was I was a kid in heaven. But it was my first ring, and now we've been through what three ring cycles, three different ring cycle productions since then. Um, oh, this is the third. We've been through two, right? Well, three: the 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 Von Karyon, the Shank, Lepage, and now whatever's coming. Whatever's coming, which I don't know about yet. So yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there are there are. In those days, you know, when when John Colshaw gave his talk and whatever, people, you're right, people did not have the wherewithal, the ones on Saturday, they would be sitting there, you know, and they'd be listening. But now it's very different. This, you know? Right. Yeah, now right. it's very different. You have the internet, you know, and you have all well, these areas and your books. And I want to talk to you about your book. Okay. Always um, happy to talk about books. Yeah, I want to talk to you about this. Uh, this, you know, I also listened, by the way, to your wonderful talk with the San Francisco Opera that you did. Ah, yeah, that ends up in one of the books in a different form. But right. Part of it, yeah. But it's great. But I want to talk to you about um, Lohengrin. Lohengrin. Oh. Okay. And That's you said something and I think people don't know it and today I actually looked at the great dictator and I thought wow so I want you to talk about that first how did you how did you come to stumble on that because let's be honest we talk about Wagner music yeah. people don't realize that children are indoctrinated with Wagnerian music because whether it was Bugs Bunny or Wile E. Coyote, they were always accompanied by Rheingold anvils, you know, or they were always accompanied by some Wagnerian music. Right. So they never really knew that they knew this music and were acclimated to it. 
But I want to know about The Great Dictator and Lohengrin. How did you come across that? Because I think that is so interesting. I mean, we could talk about every other Wagner opera, but again, everybody's talked about that. But this is a different way of seeing and hearing that music. I, one, I really appreciate you asking this specific question in that specific way, and I'll tell you why. Because what, and let me take this from the top. When you have Wagner, you have issues. And you have issues that then take the idea of art out of a place over there and into everything else. Right. That you do that better, more authentically, more, more, more urgently in Wagner's music than anywhere else, Wagner's art than anywhere else. Uh, and you have to do it. You cannot say, oh no, I, I don't want to discuss politics. I want to enjoy the music. You cannot do that. Just enjoying the music is political. And That's so right. So forth. Exactly. That is a huge, huge, huge issue in the world today. And so the reason I talked about it here in the book, and I do in every chapter, and I'll, I'll, I'll summarize that in a moment, uh, is because we have um, a lot of questions about this in the world today. And we don't want to have to talk about these things. I don't, but we do have to. Have to. And um, real quickly, this book that you have, uh, Seeking the Sublime Cash, what, what it is, is um, it started off as a compendium. I thought this would be a, a good and painless COVID project that turned out to be a whole new monster of its own, uh, of collecting articles I had written um, for various opera companies and elsewhere uh, over the years that I would put together and just have as a collection. And then I started having to write commentary about, well, for minimal commentary at first about, well, this was written for half of them, I think, are for San Francisco opera. Right, I think that, I think a lot of them are, yeah. And, um, uh, this was written for, say, San Francisco Opera in the 2012 season when they were doing Long Run, blah, blah, blah. And then the commentary took over and became a whole big thing, uh, framework. And so it's actually about two thirds new stuff built around these, these previous articles. All right, one of the articles was for Lohengrin right. at the San Francisco Opera. And I believe it was the year of, that was the uh, celebrated as the bicentennial season of Bogner and Verdi's birth. They were born uh, the same year. The same year. My Bogner himself. Yeah. yeah. Uh, during, incidentally, um, different uh, theaters of the same war, the Napoleonic Wars, as Napoleon's army was in the process of retreating from Russia, one went north, one went south. Went south. And Wagner and Verdi were both born during battles of that same action, which I'm sorry, there is no conceivable scientific way that that's just a coincidence. I think that that's something you need to know about Verdi and Wagner, the two, the twin colossi of Wagner. That's of, right. It's very true. It's but very anyway, true. so, and they were, and they were, uh, opera companies were having to um, acknowledge the Verdi and Wagner-ness of this in uh, 2013. So there was Lohengrin. Now, uh, I've also done talks like at Princeton, and well, that was a really good one, and so on about uh, just what you're talking about, the use of all opera music, operatic music in film, and therefore what, how that colors our uh, understanding of the music, but also how the music is used for film and, and right. other things and so on and so forth. Huge, huge issue. And especially, um, of course, with Wagner, it's, it's most obvious, but with Verdi, it was very interesting. And you as an Italian American that would find some of these things very uh, interesting and not untainted right. about uh, presuppositions of the role of Italian culture in American life, right. like, the, like the Sopranos. 
Right. Hey, yeah, exactly. And so on and so forth. Uh, Wagner's art is even bigger than the direct quotations of Bugs Bunny and so on and so forth, in that we have to acknowledge that all music since Wagner is in some in some way a response to Wagner, either an attempt to either using some of the things he discovered or very self-consciously like Stravinsky did in many cases, uh, kind of saying, I'm not going to write like Wagner, I'm going to write the non-Wagner, you're still responding to Wagner. Right, exactly. um, And even more, the whole idea of the Gesamtkunstwerk and how, and dimming the lights in the theater. And yeah, right, which wasn't done Bayreuth. until Bayreuth. Well, right. I have this whole theory and this whole talk, I could, I've given people, I think I make reference to it in the, um, in the chapter that was the webinar I did from San Francisco Opera about the Ring of the Evil. Right. But how, when he had to have his own theater built to present the Ring of the Evil, and because that's what a megalomaniac he was, what he did with the darkened auditorium and the raked, uh, I mean, the darkened and raked auditorium a slope and no boxes on the side and so forth was, and I, I'll stand by this, but it, it's kind of an interesting theory. He invented the movie theater before anybody invented movies. That's an interesting that supposition. It is. It is. It is. That, that movies would not have been invented, I think it was 20 years or so later, right. um, in quite the same way if there wasn't the, the spatial possibility of having them. So, okay, so the, the Wagner in our lives issue is really huge. And one of the things, the points of that is it won't do to say like, people used to say sometimes when I was writing my Wagner Without Fear book in the late 90s and people were like, you can't even write about Wagner. You're, you're endorsing Nazism and this sort of thing. And it was like, well, wait a second, because you're in it. You're living Wagner's art as much as I am writing about right. it in ways like that with you know what a theater is today, how music works and so on and so forth. So, you cannot dismiss it. We cannot cancel Wagner. And I say that in, the, in this book. Should we cancel Wagner? Maybe. No. Let me tell you why not. But right. it's worth asking the question. Okay. Now, lo so, but in my interest in movies and opera and movies where they overlap, um, you know, I am from LA, I'm from Hollywood specifically, and so on. Um, or I was at one point, I was born there. Um, and, uh, all of these questions came together. And Charlie Chaplin, I'm a big fan, find his, his work amazing. And also as a person who was very much thinking of Wagner in terms of the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total work of art, the, being the auteur. And the, right. that's a, a term we use in film now a lot that uh, derives from Wagner, oddly. Um, of course, came up and the Great Dictator is, is such a fascinating movie. It is a fascinating movie, and fascinating, absolutely. And brilliant, and uh, it's, it's a, if people aren't familiar with it, one, be familiar with it. Um, two, it's a, a sound movie. It's one yes. of you, not, from 1940, and it's not a silent movie. Um, and uh, he plays, very interesting, so the same character, Charlie Chaplin, who of course had right. a mustache that, Adolf Hitler imitated. So he plays two characters who, uh, one of whom is the Hitler character, a comical version of it, and the other is his doppelganger, who is a Jewish barber. Jewish barber. And I mean, okay, everybody who calls himself an actor or a director or a screenwriter, just retire until you, you achieve the, the great dictator. One of the ways that Chaplin um, impresses me, he, you know, he, in his autobiography, he said what he wanted to do next in his old age was write an opera. He oh, really? Did. Yeah, but he was, he did compose music, some music that we know. Many people don't realize he wrote Smile. Da, 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 right, exactly, he was the author of Smile, he was yes. the composer. Yes, and um, wrote uh, scores for his silent films, uh -huh. and so on and so forth. And uh, so the role of music in visuals is 
something he was very interested in, his own and others. Okay. And in The Great Dictator, he uses uh, the prelude to Lohengrin, uh, which is, of course, a mystical, masterful, amazing piece of music. Uh, one grumpy critic in the 19th century called it a brassiness between two squeakinesses. And it, it, it is very much a high strings, dreamy. Right. Movie. And interestingly, it, it follows a, a, a very specific format. It tell, and it tells a story. It, tells it is a story. story. Of the appearance of, a, of, a, of the grail. The Holy Grail. Right. Coming to the earth and leaving its magic and leaving. And right. Um, but it also, it, so it, it sort of repeats in melody, so you get that sort of thing going on, the, the endless melody idea. And uh, the climax is two thirds of the way through, exactly two thirds of the way through, which is true also of the prelude to Tristan and Isolde. Yes. The theory being that it takes twice as long to go up a hill as down. So, so you have a, 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 a spatial musical nexus. Someone is thinking in terms of the time-space continuum, right? How music lives in time and space. Heady stuff. But what you also have, of course, this 1940 that the film comes out is very much this association of Wagner with the Third Reich. Right, exactly. Wagner was used, uh, was, was co-opted very much. And the music in Triumph of the Will of Lenny Riefenstahl, the masterpiece cinematically of propaganda that documents the uh, a Nuremberg rally with torchlight parades. And this mm -hmm. one, and uh, Wagner's music is, is quite memorably used in it, it including Rheingold, Meisterzinger, of course. Um, I don't know if there's long, I'm sure there is somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and this had come out before, and I'm Tra Chaplin was very aware of it, I'm sure, one way or another. Or if not, this was all in the air. So now, not only aesthetically, but just um, uh, in theory, Wagner was very much claimed as a, a, a foundation of Third Reich thought. Yes, it is. And so instead of, as many people did and continue to do, saying, well, all right, so I'm not dealing with Wagner. It's like, well, Chaplin knew that that was not possible. Right. Um, so what he did was such an amazingly profound and poignant. I cannot watch that movie without being in tears. And this is why. So he uses, there's famous ballet of... Um, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the globe, with the, with the, globe. The, it's a balloon, but it's... Uh, other great ballet dancers, like actual ballet dancers, I think of Eric Brunner, I think it was, who, who gave an interview saying that's one of the best dances in history. Um, and and it's, it's kind of a dream of the Hitler character, like with the globe of dominating the whole world. And that is performed in the movie to the music of the Prelude from Lohengrin. Well, and that's a good choice. Um, low and well, now I'm going to ask you why you think that's a good choice because immediately one could. I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a inspired choice because again of the the difference of what that music represents to what his character supposedly represents. Well, it also, I mean, it shows how you can pervert. Yes, I, I was going to bring for, that up. For base yes. purposes. Right. But it also, it has a dreaminess and it's like looking at the symbol of power like the Holy Grail and thinking, what can I do with that for my own power, which is not and unknown it, in human right. history. Right, exactly. Um, so that, that's one thing you can do with it. And none of that, and that alone would be one kind of statement, but the, 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 the God moment, so to speak, comes up at the end of the movie where of course, what happens is is the switch. The, the switch that yeah. the, the Jewish barber is taken for the the Hitler character and goes to make a speech at Nuremberg. And they don't say Nuremberg, but it's obviously right. Nuremberg. Um, and he instead very boldly gives this famous speech about you know we must all resist tyranny and brutality. Right. 
And then he ends talking to his girlfriend, I guess she is, Hannah, Jewish woman, who's in the process of running away with her family. And, uh, you know, says, can you hear me? Like, have hope in tomorrow, which fell flat in 1940, unfortunately, right. but still, eventually it became true again. And then the soundtrack uses, again, music from uh, Woven In to the, from the prelude to Lohengrin. In other words, it's what you make out of it, that the same ins inspiring, transcendental, divine music you can use toward being Adolf Hitler or somebody defying and transcending right the brutality of the third reich and it right. Right. right in other words in other words art in itself is morally neutral you are responsible for making it either sublime or toxic right a word that people feel is overused these days but when you think about wagner you you have to use it so and you are responsible for doing that and you have to do that because it's powerful stuff and like scripture and sacred images like, you know, in the Sistine Chapel, that if, if you do not contribute to their positive message, their negative message will be empowered. And it, it's the most, and to use Lohengrin with it, which was very, very specifically, even within Wagner's canon, used effectively by the Third Reich in, in a lot of imagery. And not only the Third Reich, but before that, of course, the, the um, in another way, I'm not comparing the toxicity of, of Ludwig II to Adolf Hitler at all. I admire mm -hmm. Ludwig II. But, you know, the, uh, the castle of Schloss Neuschwanstein right. was built based on set designs for well, Lohengrin. From the opera, uh, from the court opera in Munich. And of course that became, you bring up Disney, that became the model for Sleeping Beauty's castle. Right. In Disneyland. So in other words, we have images here that have power and you're going to have to use them. It's so funny because you know, you bring up Disneyland, I just want to bring up a really interesting point that uh, Walt Disney in Fantasia had recorded uh, with uh, Stokowski yeah. and really did three quarters of the animation for Ride of the Valkyries yes. for the very first Fantasia. Does that exist, That any of that animation? In, I think it does, yes. I've seen part right? of it. I Because when I worked for Disney, I did see part of it, which is like... Really? Well, and yeah, and but because of the whole anti-Semitic feeling towards Wagner... They decided to pull the it. Feeling of Wagner is anti-Semitic. Well, yeah, right. Yes, right, uh, right exactly. Um, but they, what they decided to do was pull it and do um, the Rite of Spring. Right. Which, which it's funny. Which twenty years before, at another point, would have been much more controversial. Exactly. Yeah, politically. Exactly. Um, and now you know. It's so you rich. Think, Thank you, Aaron. I want to ask you, because then I, I just want to touch very quickly on, on your metal side. But I want, to, oh, I want to tell you a very interesting point. You brought up about La Boheme, that you call it the, the it's older people looking back. Yes. Yes, I've I been think about that a lot lately. Yeah. It's it, yes, yes. But I have to tell you that Detroit, I don't know if you heard, because yes, one yes. of our singers is the Musetta in it. Well, uh, Detroit is doing it like merrily we roll along. They're right. doing it backwards. They're right. starting four, three, two, one without an intermission. Right. Like, how did we get? How did we get here from there? I and was, I just think it is a. It's wonderful because it is older people looking back on their lives. Yeah. No. It. It. it you know. One of the. Okay. One of the things that I'm doing in all of my work, in my writing and as much as I can, my commentary and in my talks is not, not so much, I want to 
get rid of our basic assumptions about things because the classics that we're talking about here can hold up to right. the assessment. Right. And when you get something like La Boheme, I am coming to La Boheme with a point of view of I am sick of the condescending tone that people have, that a lot of great experts and musicians. And, you know, I just read someone posting online, I got to say, you may read this, uh, a conductor saying like, ugh, I, I just hate when I have to conduct Puccini. And I really wanted to put him on blast and just say that, then get the hell out of this business. I don't right. want you. Right. I don't want you around. Um, and also just the idea of the things that people keep saying about Bohem that may have been true in 1898 or two years after it came out, but I don't think our, nothing can be true the same way that your great grandfather said. It can't That's right. because you don't have his experience and, um, or lack of it. You know, like the world has heard Bohem in different, in a lot of ways. And we've, frankly, we've learned something about it. One of the things I've learned uh, it, with the collective building of experience of La Boheme is it's better than, than they thought it was. Right. Not only, not only musically, but what Puccini hit on structurally is more profound than anybody in 1910 or so would have suspected was there, um, that you couldn't have known it. I had another conductor say to me uh, something I liked, which he said, I didn't really see how great La Boheme was until I, about the hundredth time I conducted it. And I thought, I, I love that. So things like that this is um, a good opera for young people, uh, or it's, it's, you know, it's your, best first opera. Well, I don't really know if that's true anymore. I don't know if it ever was, but I don't know if that's quite true. It is a good first opera because it's a good opera. Right. But I've had more luck with bringing young people today to, well, say Wagner. I've seen young people, kids at Valkyrie and Goethe Danrock. Yes. yes, I and uh, Wagner is not weird the way it was 120 years ago, because like I said, everything's become like Wagner. Right. I don't need to explain things to people in order to, to, I don't need to explain things about the music of Wagner in order to give them a good experience of first experience in the house. I do need to with Donizetti. Right. I have to explain melody to young people today not explain melody, but explain what, how melody was used, beautiful melody in a way that is very confusing to them in a way that Botsek, which is, you know, supposed to be so dissonant and all, Botsek's not a problem for young people. Life is dissonant. They're like, fine. Electra, oh, oh, this is scary. Electra's not scary. No, Electra's not scary. But, I mean, it never was, but it, to young audiences. But Donizetti, they come to me and they say, this going on. Uh, but she's yeah. all covered with blood. Why is she singing so beautifully? Yes. Hello. Hello. Yes. And, and that, you know, well, melody didn't mean everything's pretty to Donna. Right. Trump. Melody meant she meant it emotionally. Melody meant it was truth. Right. So um, things like that. So for La Boheme, a lot of like, well, yes, there are beautiful melodies. Yeah, there are beautiful melodies, but that's not what, that's not where the vein of gold is in La Boheme. That's right. Uh, the vein of gold is in how they're used and what that tells us about what hu the human experience is like. And it's very profound. And for me, I, I enjoy Bohem much more now that I am to certain age, you know, like <laughs> of a certain age than I did. I mean, I always loved it, of course, but as a teenager, it didn't speak to my experience as it, as much as it speaks to my experience now of being middle-aged at best, looking back on what it was like that morning after college. Right. Which did not seem all that much fun at the time. Right. And now, oh my God, it was, you know, it was all about free love and living by being a great artist and being cute and everybody liking me like Rodolfo. It, it, 
it wasn't as pretty. And I think that, that as it seems in Act One and Acts One and Two of Love OM, which I think is what Love, Love OM is about, that moment when things get real. Right, and, and that's Act Three. Pay the rent. That's right. That's right. Uh, very quickly, because I, I want to just get this in. Um, many years ago, I was I had the great pleasure and honor of talking to Leonard Bernstein. Oh yes. And uh, and r rap and hip hop were just brand new. Yeah. And I will never forget that I said to him, so tell me, what do you think of this? And he said to me, well, you know, with that wonderful accent that he had. Wherever it came from, yeah. Wherever it came from. He said, um, well, I like uh, rap, but let's say it's like opera. And I looked at him and he said, well, it tells a story. He said, so if you listen to it like opera, you're going to enjoy it. And he was absolutely right. And that's so, what you need to do with everything. Well, that, well, true. So where, in this case, how do you approach that metal music? Because I've always had a problem getting into it, but that's me. I didn't grow up in a house that listened to it. I mean, I grew well, up in I a house lie. that listened to it. Well, mother. no, I mean, I grew up in a house that, at best, my parents listened to elevator music. And on Sunday, my grandmother listened to Jerry Vale and Frank Sinatra. And oh, Saturday, sure. we listened to the opera. So, Which is great. Well, it's, right. it's all the same thing. I'll tell you, well, first of all, I didn't grow up in a house that listened to metal because it didn't exist yet. Right, yes, right. I know okay. that. But what I meant, <laughs> but, yes. No, but, no, I mean, but the idea that, that Leonard Bernstein said to you of listen for the story, this is right. what, beyond metal, like this is what I tell everybody with, with any popular song, any Broadway song, any rap song, any rap is we're all just telling stories here. That's right. That's all we're doing. And that's all I know because my background is literature, not music. I'm not a musician. I am not a musician. I can read it. I, you know, I was in choir as much, you know, until I started working here and I could work nights and do rehearsals in the choir. But, you know, I'm not, believe me. You know, I just go up until the choir director looks at you funny and then you go down or whatever, you know. Um, what's the story here? And this is something that comes up in my work a lot. The story is not the synopsis. The story is not the lyrics of a song, of a song, of a three minute song. The story is the logos. You know, the, the like the story, what's the story here, right? Right. Okay, now I'm going to tell you a little story on metal. Okay, there, there is a, a metal singer, very highly regarded as a songwriter, but also as a, as a writer. He writes books and this sort of thing. And he came out with a book and, uh, you know, you get a lot of these sort of closet intellectuals in, in, in the metal world. It's kind of neat. And uh, he was on book tour and he said something that, I've been living off of since, this is about six years ago. And he said, heavy, heaviness in music isn't a matter of how hard you hit the drum, man. It's a matter of how much the music weighs. Now that's very interesting, brilliant. And so when, now I'll do a little diva name dropping. So when Susan Graham, said to me in the cafeteria here at the Met a few years ago, like it was before that, she said, what's this metal thing you're all about? Like, what's your connection to it? And I said, I don't know, but I will, as soon as I find out, I'll let you know. And then when Randy Bly, who's the singer, uh, group Lamb of God, very extreme, very extreme, said that, I thought, okay, one. So that got me thinking about the connection to opera and places like where in Don Carlos, my favorite opera, things that always struck me, well, well, all right, I'll just tell the whole story. So then I was at, and I tell this in the book, but I was at a metal festival, you know, one of these three day outdoor things in Montreal, as a matter of fact. Uh, and Yannick was on my mind at that time. This is before he was the head. Right, music. the head conductor. And, um, but I was in Montreal. And 
they had a, a, a sculpture installation, I guess, of these um, puppet things of basically monks, red monks, very tall. And it was very strange. It was, it was like in the middle of the park and I had just seen Randy Bly and I heard in my mind, like, do you ever, do you know what I mean? When you hear mm -hmm. something in your mind and you swear there's actual sound, right. right? Right. And it was that a bit of music that ar arrested me, stopped me in my tracks. The first time I heard it when I was 16, happened to be in Italy. Uh, and it's the music before the, um, the prior in the beginning of the, First monastery scene in Don Carlos. Don Carlo, or so Act One, oh, Scene Two. In yeah. most editions, yes. but not always, right? Okay. Right. Oh, 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 oh. No, Act Two, Scene One. Oh, oh yeah, Act Two, Scene One, right? Oh, 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 bum, bum, oh. Right. Right. <laughs> the first time I heard that, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know I was ever supposed to think anything of it, whatever. I knew right away the first time back in 1977, this music is going to be coming up in your life. Yeah. Did you ever have that? Like yes. where you hear something and you, it's not even yes. good or bad, but this is now part of my psyche. <clears throat> so I had that. And then fast forward to 2014 or whatever it was in Montreal. And there was this the red monks, of course. And I, Again, and I had many times in between, but I heard that music and having just seen this metal performer who gave me that line about the meaning of heaviness in music, I got to associate that and I realized that music can weigh a lot and be of any kind of uh, volume or uh, it, can, it can be very quiet if it's far away in the past, if it's repressed. Right. She pressed in you. So then I, I ran and I, well, first of all, I texted Yannick and I was like, I think I've just figured out the meaning of God. Explain it to me. And in his, <laughs> in his, to his credit, he was like, um, no, but remind me the next time I see you. So I chased him down the hallway here at the Met once and, and we had this talk about time and um, basically heaviness in music. So in that way, I learned to mine what am I what am I going for here besides just either volume or aggressive superficial aggressiveness and all this. It's Verdi who taught me this, not just Verdi of Don Carlo, but Il Trovatore. Right. Which is, I think, a very misunderstood opera because everyone's like, oh, it's so stupid. It's like, no, it's not stupid. It might it's be a lot. It's right. like a doodle, but it's not stupid. Um, and so on and so forth. So the other thing on that in terms of telling a story is when you look at any song, any three minute song, in terms of, well, what's the story here? The first thing you have to do is say, who is the character? who is telling me this story, right? right. Not exactly. a Sinatra song. I mean, this God, was he a genius at this? So is the, the guy, in that case, is he suggesting that he's a person like St. My Way, which is, I think, a fascinating song in that I, I think it, it's not a great song. It's great what he does with it. Right. So that he's a character of, he makes you convinced that there's a character sitting maybe in a bar telling you like, this is the true story of my life. But you have to believe that when you hear somebody else singing my way and you don't have that, you don't know who it is so well, it, it's ridiculous. It, it, the, the character is like, why are you sitting here talking about right. that? So on and so forth. So you have to consider that. And when, and I say this to my friends, I have a lot of, I, I'm very, uh, connected with the local uh, sort of underground, we call it, uh, heavy metal scene, which means not famous bands that you'll never hear. Of. And one of the reasons is because I can know the, the people who are singing. So when they're screaming or growling or being aggressive and talking about crazy things, I need to know, are they, who are they? Is that person on my side? Is that person angry for me? 
or, or against me. And I need to know that or else I can't participate in your ritual, which is what all of this stuff is. Right. And, and, and I'll close with this. And that goes back to the, the heavy, like if you are, you might be expressing with your growling and your screaming, your aggressiveness, you might be expressing things that are in me, that are repressed in me, that I don't have the voice to express. Mm -hmm. Just like at the upper, when Aida, this is my favorite example, but there are lots of them. <clears throat> you know how in the triumphal scene in Aida, which is the most complex and loud, frankly, scene Verdi ever wrote. There are three separate orchestras in the pit, on stage, backstage. There's a, a 20 vocal parts, both right. uh, solo and choral. And chorus. Yeah. Pieces, like first tenor, second tenor, and there's 20 vocal parts. At, if, if, if you see them conduct with a score, they're just flying through it. Marco Emiliato said, well, he never conducts with a score, but he said, no, you, you do 4-4 four, four, and they have to find you. You right. can't conduct that like that. And all, well, he said something like that, more intelligent, but anyway. And everybody's going off. And then what happens? The Aidas that we remember, like, you know, Lantine Price and the great Aidas, they hit, I think it's a B, B natural. Right. Ah, and it shuts everyone up. And so it's, and she there is, she's not singing just a, character she's performing a ritual for me in the audience saying she's the most unimportant person on that stage she's got kings and high priests and princesses or she's princess disney style and nobody knows it she's right. a slave so she's officially the most unimportant person on the stage but she has a voice and so she says yeah okay great with your armies and your nations and but matu re yeah right well that her father actually says the word right. she she makes that possible right and yeah and they say yeah you're the king now but you maybe you won't be next time and so on and what she's done is given voice to all of that in me that's running around new york i'm on my bike now you know saying like hey ah what about me don't i count for something the same way that Metal, I got to tell you, last night we had a benefit, fans in the community for a Ukrainian um, organizations mm -hmm. in New York. Mm -hmm. And I was saying, you know, like an idiot just doing this and thinking, you know, with, in politics and the news, and there were things, you know, in the last couple of days that- Yeah, they've been crazy. Made, really making my blood pressure uh, go through the sky and I'm not happy about it. And, the experience of being with people um, in that environment, bouncing your head and feeling people expressing anger for me, like I've had at the opera. I, I gotta tell you, Steve, it's not going too far to say these things and this heavy music, including what I right. did at the opera, right. Mozart, whoa, um, saves my life. Yes. And has on a consistent level. Yes. From the beginning. And you yes. know what I'm talking about. Uh, I, you know there were times when you could not, when nothing could make all that make sense to you. It still doesn't make that make sense to you, but how you're going to live with it. Yes. Find those answers in this art. That's right. That's absolutely. That. I have to tell you real fast. You know, you, you mentioned about who, what are you saying? I teach my students, I, I teach um, I, um, singing, singing Sondheim, singing Broadway yeah. course, workshop with the company. And I tell them all, everything is the five W's. Who, what, where, when, and why. Do that in your song. I mean, your song is what, three minutes? Just do that in your song. Oh, but should we do that with the whole character? Yes, that's a whole different arc. But each song has the right, you know, yeah. Richard Strauss said each note has a right to breathe. He told Luba yes. Yes. Each song has a right to breathe and has a right to answer the, if you can answer these questions, you, the song will come alive. If you cannot answer any of the, especially who you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you, can have, you can't sing this song. You're just, okay. One more quick story. So, and I, I 
if you mention this in my book too, but we had a- I know, sure you do, and I want people to buy your book. But go ahead. You, yeah, um, yeah, reach me direct and I'll, I'll uh, give you a discount. So, oh, where were you when I bought it? I was going to tell everybody, buy it on Amazon. Like you I can buy it on Amazon, but I can also, you can send me a direct message uh, on Instagram or uh, through Stephen. And I can right, uh, and I'll tell them that. They can do it through the right. company, and I will pass it on to uh, Will Berger, and he will get you these books. And it's a right. must read. And if also, you look follow me on Instagram, WBNY City, WBNY City. Okay, but one uh, quick last story. We had a press person here she, a few years ago. She's my age and she had been involved in the uh, punk scene in London in the 70s. Yes, and, you mentioned that in the book. Yeah, which I was too, but not as deeply as she was, but enough right. to follow her story, right? Um, and she came out of, it was Giulio Cesare in Egipto of Handel, Julius Caesar in Egypt. And she, yeah, you know, Handel, well, I'll put handle in terms of heaviness up there with anybody. Oh no, boy, right? you go. Oh. But you got three hours gotta, of that. You got to be there to hear it. You've got to right. be in the right place. You got to be asking the questions like you say you want the singers to ask. You got to be asking those questions low key to yourself in the audience, like what's going on up there. Right. You know? So she comes out and she's walking up this dress rehearsal. She's walking up the aisle of the Met in that glaze, like when handle works. You know, like huh. And she says to me, I get it. It's just like punk. And I said, could you explain that? Because I think I need to hear what you're about to say, but you need to explain. And she said, no, really, because without some kind of context, it really is just noise. That's right. And I was like, that is, and kind of, that's all Maybe. you and I have to do in our work, you directly with singers, but also with audiences, everything. It's like, what's the context here? And then the, the notes, the dots on the page with the right production, you know what I mean by production, but with the right performance, they'll tell all the story. All we have it's, to do is- You say in the book about the Amen at the end of Vandal's Messiah. I'll never yes. forget when I conducted the Amen, I four realized- on one word. It's, it's four minutes of music, melisma, one word, Amen. It is the hardest thing to do because after a while, it's like, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man, okay, oh, man. But it is the crowning glory of the whole piece. If you think the hallelujah choruses, no, I, it's, it's important, it's, it's wonderful, it's, it's but it's the, the amen it's is the ethereal. It's of, of human existence. It's one of the reasons why you want to say humanity, yeah, kind of a rotten yeah. species. We are the species that the Amen from Messiah came out of. That's right. I, I could say the same about that. I think, I think that's people. wonderful. Yeah. Listen. Um, yeah. I want to thank you. I mean, we could go on well, talking. I, I, I've got a lot more to talk about. So, yeah. Well, then you know. you're going to come back. Well, We're well, going to do another one. Specific topics. You know what else we should, I, and maybe not here, but let, you know, we, let's do a thing on opera and film. Well, I taught webinar. a class. I taught a class on opera and film at ASU. And I am, what, what's today? In 20 days, I'm actually giving a paper at NYU at Music and the Moving Image Conference, and it's on Henry Mancini. Really? Yeah. Cool. Fun fact. Really? Right. Old is a distant cousin of mine. Really? I had an uncle by marriage, uh, Mancini, who was oboist of the Rome Opera. And wow. in the 70s. And um, he was like, oh, yeah, he's he's a cousin of my son. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, you know, and now, of course, with Italian relatives, say, no, never, or I've been. Yeah, right. Whatever it was, whatever it was. Right. Like my grandmother used to say, oh, Madonna, she's so nice. She's Italian, you know. But, <laughs> uh, but um, the thing about Henry Mancini, he's dead now 26 years. Yeah. 26, 27 years. It's like no one knows who he is, and yeah. yet he- Huge figure in music. Huge figure in yeah. music, in, in screen music. Yeah. 
uh, in scoring. People have I mean, lived with his music that have no idea who he is. Right, and and if you listen, in the, and the whole idea of nostalgia, when you listen to a Henry Man, you listen to Moon River, you're just, and that harmonica comes in, I'm sorry, you are transported. Um, the Sweetheart Tree, um, anything from Victor Victoria, the opening of Victor Victoria with right. the music. Well, I mean, you're onto something here. I mean, what it is, is the same thing as Bohem. It's the same thing as the Amen. Exactly. It's the manipulation of time. The reason the Amen works, why you can keep saying Amen for four minutes is because he's manipulated time. Right. In, in, in Mancini's case, he literally, and I guess the same thing with Handel, if you want to look at it that way, they literally make time stand still. Yes. Stand still, or I, I think of it as suspended because standing still sounds like- Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. I know you're busy. We've been trying to do this for a while. Yeah, I know. It's, 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 I, I can't believe we got this much time today and I didn't get someone knocking at the door. I've got a quiz coming up. I've got everything. It's crazy. Uh, well, I can't tell you how much, how much fun this has been. You will be back. We got to have you come back. Hey, again. All right. Well, we'll focus something on a topic instead of. Right, something. right. But so, Mary Ignatius. I, I have to tell you, people, please, Seeking the Sublime Cash. You can't see it, but there it is. There it seeking is. the Sublime Cash. It is a fabulous. Is it with with a, a, wait a second. With a forward. By, by Jamie Barton. Yes, that was wonderful. And we this one is true. Around here. No. And speaking of Wagner, talking to audiences about the Ring of the Nibelung, and this is yeah. a wonderful book too. That's an interesting book. It's expensive yeah. online, but um, it's an actual Yes, but it was book. wonderful. Yeah, uh, but I really, I managed to get a lot of things in there that made me go, hmm, uh, in a short period of time. So I highly... I want to highly recommend it if I can. Can you recommend your own book? Yeah, why yeah, not? Something like that. Uh, yeah. Academica Press, and uh, you can also get this on Amazon or write to me, or write to Will, and I'm sure we can work you on can getting your copies. You can do that if you want to yeah. Yeah, 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 oh, yes. WBNY yeah, City, WBNY City at Instagram. Let, let's and listen to um, Sirius Radio. The metal. <laughs> oh. <laughs> listen to Sirius Radio. And then on Saturday, um, the other the other innovation Will does with the opera quiz is that he has an, a singer um, every opera quiz. Featured artist, yeah. Featured yeah, artist. it's a not, featured not artist. Singer. Yeah, and it's wonderful. And uh, and he 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 really uses a lot of wonderful people. One of our singers, um, uh, Melanie Spector, has been a, uh, a, 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 a um, and of course another good Melanie friend. Melanie Spector's Mike. on the panel though. She's not. She's not right. The, she's on the panel. Yeah. That's our saying. She's on the panel. And uh, Melanie and I, we, we, Melanie did a master class for me, and I walked over to her and I said, "Did you know I was also too?" She didn't know that, so she said, oh, "I have to go back now and listen to when you were there." And I went, "Oh no!" But that's okay. Um, and also, uh, Corey Ellison. There's yeah. another, no, she's actually going to be doing the next one, the next Diva Talk with me. Oh, good. Yeah. And, about? Uh, I have no idea. I've known, I knew Corey when Corey sang for me many, many years ago. She did Orlovsky. Yeah. 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 That's gone well, back her, a long time. One other thing, if you get her talking about dramaturgy and like what makes, what that's what I was going to do. Yeah. It's like, it's yes. amazing. Yeah, yes, and super works. titles because she came around when super titles were brand new. Yeah. Yes. And she made them a lot better than they were. They were. Oh, yeah. Well, Will, thank you so much. And um, thank you, everybody. And please uh, continue to listen to these podcasts. We uh, write to me, tell me what you want to hear, who you want to hear. Uh, we've had Aprile Milo, Eve Quella. Um, so. Um, Big people. We've had some really good people, and uh, uh, we're getting uh, Broadway people too. We've had Elena Batman from The Phantom of the Opera, oh, wow. and of course, uh, Tashina Vaughan and Luana DeVoe. Um, and uh, so we're looking to do a lot more. Thank you very much, and we will talk to you soon.